Welcome to Data Structures and Applications, third semester subject in which this is the second session of the graphs, that is module five graphs. So let us continue with the representation of graphs. We have started with the first way by which we can represent a graph. For instance, the adjacency matrix. So we shall just uh, quickly go on to the continuation of the same and I'll take you to the PPT now. Yeah, so it's now. So we have this. Let me run the slideshow. Yeah, now set of points related to the adjacency matrix. Uh, you can see that this is the previous of the graphs in which the representation of the same, so then undirected and then directed where it's a Boolean matrix in which we have zeros and ones. One indicates that there is a direct edge between those two vertices i, comma j, and uh, otherwise it is zero. So what are the various points which we have in this? Yes, we have adjacency matrix on the undirected graph is symmetric. What does it mean? It means that you can see here one comma five and five comma one is same. For instance, let's take three comma one. It is one <clears throat> and one comma three is again one because in an undirected graph, we have the edge, you know, it's between one and two and two and one. There is no direction and hence the, the entry, what we make in the adjacency matrix is the same. The memory requirements for an undirected or directed graph is always theta of n square. That means we represent whether we have, you know, less number of edges or more number of edges. That means all pairs of vertices are connected, complete kind of set of edges we have. Doesn't matter, we have to have number of rows and columns, same as the number of vertices, that is n by n, hence it is n square. So in order to understand what the graph is all about, you have to go through all rows and all columns, which means that the complexity is theta of n square. Instead of storing the adjacency matrix as a two-dimensional integer array, because let's say each integer takes two bytes, we can actually store bits because we don't, uh, you know, store other than zero and one. Hence, we don't need to waste two bytes for each integer. Thereby, we can reduce the overall memory. So the overall time complexity is always big O of n square. Uh, I think you will be studying about this complexity notations. These are called as the asymptotic notations, mathematical notations in order to uh, uh, represent the complexity of any algorithm. How much time, theoretically of course, how much time an algorithm takes at the worst case. So big O of n square. So let's now move on to the second way of representing the graph, which we call it as the adjacency list. <clears throat> so what is adjacency list? Instead of storing it as a matrix, <clears throat> sorry, now we will store this in the form of a list. That means linked list. So for a given graph, let's take, for instance, a directed graph. Now assume that we have n number of vertices. So we have n as your number of locations. So this is an array. And each of these locations in this array will point to a linked list. So it's an array of pointers. Now, what does it mean? It means that for each vertex, what are the adjacent vertices? Which are those adjacent vertices? So that depends upon each vertex. For instance, here, let me just pick my pen. Oh, sorry. 
uh, yeah so so i have let's take vertex number one i have an outgoing edge here to two and that's it so i have just only one adjacent vertex which is two uh, for vertex one so from one you can see here it points to a linked list where it the info field of this node actually contains the vertex number now you can have any number of info fields about this vertex adjacent vertices but here since we would like to store only the vertex number we just store the adjacent vertex and since we don't have any other adjacent vertices with respect to vertex 1 it becomes the last node in which the next field is null similarly let's assume that we have say 4 as my reference vertex now from 4 i have one i have two edges one pointing to one and the other pointing to vertex number five so i'll have two nodes now you can see here four i have the first node which is one you can represent five first and then one it doesn't matter so because the the, the order in which you store is immaterial so the first vertex adjacent to four is one you can see here the next vertex is five so that is uh, the representation we show for vertex number four. So for each vertex in this adjacency list, what we do is we create a linked list. That means it points to the linked list where all the adjacent vertices are shown. So if you go through this array, you can get all the details of the graph whether it is directed or undirected. I'll show you the undirected one uh, shortly. But here there's an advantage where the number of edges, what we have only those many nodes you will have here, unless you have, you know, uh, one or two vertices or one or more vertices pointing to the same. For example, three and four, three has outgoing edge one and four also outgoing one. So you can see here, I'll have two nodes with the same vertex number, right? So the adjacency list is nothing but an array of uh, pointers where each pointer points to a linked list in which the adjacent vertex numbers are stored. So if I want to know who are all my, uh, I mean, the adjacent vertices of a particular vertex for, I can just index, for instance, who are the adjacent vertices uh, with respect to four, I simply go to this array index. Indexing can be done because adjacent of four, I can just go through this link because I'll have the header here. That means the, uh, the, the pointer to the first node, I can just keep going to, 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 to this particular link list and get all the adjacent vertices. Coming to the yeah, undirected one, I have four vertices. You can see here that there are, there, there are some repetitions because one to two, two to one, we have to represent. Otherwise, the representation is same as the directed one where I have four vertices here. So four locations in the array and each location is pointing to a linked list. For example, from one, I have two, three and four. So you can see here two, three, four so these are the three adjacent vertices for vertex number one similarly for four i have two the one and two you can see here one and two so it's very simple to represent this graph undirected or directed using what is known as adjacency list so it's a list of adjacent vertices now the third way is before that, I think we will get some inferences because we can compare the representation of adjacency list with respect to adjacency matrix. Yeah, so these are some of the takeaways. Uh, the adjacency list representation has a better memory usage because the adjacency matrix is always n square. You can see here it is n by n, but here it's not like that. 
So in terms of memory usage, yes, it is better than adjacency matrix. The memory required for an undirected graph is dependent on E again because we store the edge information in this. So N is nothing but this one because this is a must, this array. So we need N number of locations plus this edges. So for an undirected one, each one we will have to show it in two nodes. For example, one to two, two to one. So we have two into E. So the total memory required is N plus two into E. And in an undirected graph, every pair of vertices, that is I to J and J to A must be stored in adjacency list. That's why it is two into E. But the same thing is not true for directed one or a digraph. So you go, don't get that two into. So that's removed and so you have N plus E. So in a digraph, each edge information is to be stored uniquely because the, the cost of travel, for instance, from I to J may differ from J to I. And hence the time complexity is not N square, but it is just N because we just go through this array in order to get. So that is the uh, the memory, I'm sorry, the time complexity uh, for uh, representing a graph using adjacency list. Now there is a third way called as adjacency multi list. Now what is the difference between this and the previous one adjacency list? It's very simple that it is a modified version of adjacency list where adjacency list is more uh, vertex driven but adjacency multi list is edge driven. You can see here it is edge driven. So how do we represent for a given graph? Let's assume that it's an undirected graph. This uh, graph has uh, six vertices you can see and uh, seven edges. Now we need to label each edge because it's edge driven. So we have edge names A1, E2, etc. up to E7. So each edge is given a name. So we have six vertices and seven edges. How do we store this? Well, so what we do is we create a node structure. So this is the node structure. I'll come to this uh, structure in the next slide. Now the first field you can see here, this first field is the mark, marking field. That means a, whether a particular vertex is already visited or not. Then we have the vertex numbers which connect this edge. So let's assume that now this is marked, right? Now what are the, for edge one I'm talking about. So what are the vertices? We have zero and one. So I can put the, that is VI comma VJ or VI and VJ. So these are the two vertices, zero and one. Now with respect to these vertices, which are the uh, edges connecting these vertices. For example, for 0, I have E2. So if at all I put E2 here, it should, have, it should not have been already marked. Because this is the first edge, obviously E2 has not been marked, so I can simply say that it is edge 2. And what is the edge connecting 1? I have E3, so I can just put E3 here. Next, I'll go for edge two. So I'll just mark this as visited or it's already seen. Now for edge two, which are the vertices zero and two. So zero and two are the two vertices connecting this edge. Now for zero vertex, that is for VI, which is the edge, it is E1. Now E1 is already marked. So I just put null. So I'll just say null. Now, which is the edge connecting to this second vertex that is VJ that is nothing but for the edge 2, for edge 2, edge 2 0 and we have E4 because E2, E2 is the edge we are talking about in which we have two vertices 0 and 2 
for zero we have e1 right and for two we have e4 so you should not get confused in terms of the vertices and edges so e2 is the one which are talking about and the vertices are zero and two which i've already put it here i mean entered here in this structure and zero vertex has a connecting edge now we may have multiple edges also from a particular what i'll come to that but for the moment fortunately we have only one edge being connected and hence we have e1 sorry uh, for uh, zero we have e1 for two we have e4 now for zero i have e1 which is already marked and hence i don't need to do it again so we don't repeat that and for two, we have E4, which is not at mark. So I can just say E4. Now, in case if you have multiple edges where both are uh, not marked yet, then you can arbitrarily select one of those. It could be two, three, four, multiple edges. Any edge you can just take because once that is marked, uh, then obviously subsequent structures, that means subsequent edges in the structure, you will not have uh, been repeating. So we will just say that it is null. So when I have uh, E2, I have the vertices return and the edges, if at all it's vis not visited or not marked, then you can put uh, uh, the same edge number. Otherwise, it is null. So it has a marking field. It has the vertex numbers connecting these edges, edge, and then we have the uh, outgoing or incoming edges for these two vertices. So if it is already visited or marked, then we just put null, otherwise we put the edge number. So if we start filling up this, then we will have, you can just remember this E2, E3, you can see E2, E3, null and E4. What I have written is the final structure. So let me just delete this and we can verify it's correct or not. Let us arbitrarily select, uh, yeah, this E6. E6, 4 and 5. So we can see here 4 and 5. This is marked. Though it's not mentioned, it is understood that it is marked. So we have 4 and 5. For 4, we have E5 and E7. Now E5 is already marked, but E7, it's not. So I can just put E7. Now coming to the fifth vertex, now I don't have any what uh, uh, you know edge connecting this. Okay, so I can put null. So there are chances that you have multiple edges, you have no edges, etc. In any case, if it's multiple edges, just see whether all edges have already been marked. If so, null. Otherwise, put the edge number. Now, in case we don't have any edge, then you put null. So we can represent uh, in an edge form. That means all edges and then the details of the vertices connecting this edge plus the outgoing or incoming edges, depending upon whether it's a directed or undirected graph. So how does the, uh, the structure of each node look like? It's like this. Marking field, these are the two vertices connecting this edge and then the links for each of these vertices, VI and then VJ. Okay. So that's how you get this same figure as we have seen in the previous slide. And we can in turn get the vertex details as well, starting from zero to six. Now, which are those uh, edges connecting these vertices? So this is another way of representing the same graph, directed or undirected, not in the vertex form, maybe in the edge form. Right, now let's move on to the abstract data type for graph. As you've already studied for stack, Q, ADT, we have a set of uh, data pertaining to the graph and the member functions. So objects is nothing but a set of vertices and edges, directed or undirected. And this is the data pertaining to this. So we have how many vertices and how many edges depending upon whether it is directed or undirected. And each edge, of course, is connected via a pair of vertices. So what are the functions we have? 
we can think of what is known as create graph that is creation so this returns actually a data type of graph so the first function because without creating a graph this is a representation either adjacency matrix or adjacency list so you have to create a graph so given a set of vertices and set of edges we can actually create so this function creates a basic graph and uh, it doesn't store any details of course so it creates uh, that and returns an empty graph the next function is supposing if you have already created a graph empty you can insert a vertex so we have a function called insert vertex where to this graph now i can insert a vertex so there are two ways either you can have parameter which is not shown here that how many vertices how many edges and things like that or this is more uh, more generic where i can just create an empty graph and insert as many vertices i want so this inserts a vertex similarly i can insert an edge so you need two vertices because edge corresponding to which are the vertices so this expects two more parameters apart from the graph so to this graph i add or insert two vertices now comes to deletion so you can delete a vertex from the given graph which vertex you want to delete so the connecting edges also will automatically get deleted and uh, edge also can be deleted in which the vertices corresponding to that will also get deleted and we have well to find out at any point of time whether the graph is empty that means no vertices no edges similar to whether the stack is empty or not or q is empty or not is empty is a general function now we have uh, a list consisting of which are the vertices which are adjacent for a any given vertex so as per the graph there could be many vertices which are adjacent so i can get all the details of these vertices for a any given vertex so this defines your abstract data type now let's move on to the traversal methodologies as we have already seen there are two traversal methods number 1 is called as depth first search that is dfs in short remember that it is a traversal method it is a traversal method similar to linked list tree or array that means i can in array of course it's not traversal we can just index it you can directly go in linked list you can't directly go because there is nothing like node number you have to for instance let's assume that we have three nodes in a linked list now this is my last node pointed by p so if i want to go to the second node or any ith node i have to start from the beginning because i have only one pointer to this linked list so in order to go through or browse through my linked list i start from here i can go to any node similarly in a tree you have to apply in order pre order or post order starting from the root node because you can't directly go to any specific node uh that's not a uh, that's not the way in that data structure so you start from the root go to the left and keep going uh, in a recursive way and you can visit all the vertices in the tree or all nodes in the tree similarly here in a graph we need to traverse given any starting vertex visit each and every vertex now there are two systematic ways of doing it one of course is called as dfs depth first search another one is called as breadth first search so ultimately these two uh, methodologies or these two algorithms eventually give me a tree it's called as a depth first tree or a breadth first tree so the input for 
the DFS or BFS is actually a graph. It could be directed or undirected, connected or disconnected. It doesn't matter. So when under the case of disconnected, uh, what exactly it finds, what exactly it gives away. We'll see all that later. So maybe we can take the simplest example of connected graph, uh, undirected, then we can see all the rest. OK. This also being solved using what is known as decrease by one technique because there are several techniques available in order to solve the problems or designing the algorithms like uh, divide and conquer, brute force, decrease and conquer, etc. Branch and bone, backtracking. You will study all that in fourth semester under design and analysis of algorithms. Well, so here we assume that there are uh, n number of vertices in a given graph called G. So G is a given graph. Assume that we have N vertices. And uh, once we are able to go through this graph in a systematic way, that means once we are able to traverse uh, by using this algorithm, we can actually get a lot of applications. So what are those? We can check whether a graph is connected or not. So connectivity issues can be checked. Assume that there is some uh, breakage of the links or the edges uh, in me which means that original it was connected and probably because of some reasons is disconnected we can actually find it using or by applying this algorithm next finding whether a graph has cycles or not okay uh, because sir, there are some graphs like dag directed acyclic graph which you will again study later one of the applications of that is topological sar so that again has its own applications. Well, so in such cases, there are graphs where we do not have any cycles, in which case we can actually find whether a graph has cycle or not. Third one is called as whether connected component, what exactly a connected component is, and a biconnected component as well in the later part of the discussion. Uh, this is also connected to articulation points. So there are graphs which have some articulation points which do not have articulation. What is the meaning of articulation point and how is it uh, related to biconnected components and uh, uh, subgraphs? You know, so connected components, articulation point, biconnected components, subgraph, all these are some of the uh, Terminology is used in graph data structure and each one has its own applications. So, I mean, in turn, but these are the general ways by which uh, we can apply depth first or breadth first search in order to uh, get all this information. Okay, now we shall show how depth first search works. So the objective here, of course, is very simple that we start from a particular given vertex and visit each and every vertex in the graph. That's it. How do we do it? So we go in a depth wise manner. So the, the inherent data structure being useful in order to achieve this is called as a stack. So we'll just start with the given graph G where we have eight vertices. Okay, now let's assume that the starting vertex is one. If the starting vertex is not given, you can assume the any vertex, of course, but normally we start with zero or one. So we have numbered the vertices here in this graph as one, two, three, and so on up to eight. So how does it work? It works in this fashion, like you start with one and we have two adjacent vertices, that is two and three. So you can select any one arbitrarily. So I'll just, uh, in order to make it uniform, I'll just select the lowest number uh, depending upon which are my adjacent vertices. So in this case, I have two and three, and hence I just go for two instead of three. Obviously, you can go for three as well. It doesn't matter. OK, so now I have two vertices adjacent or any number of matter. You just arbitrarily select one of those adjacent vertices. So from one, I just go to 2 and from 2 
I look for adjacent vertices. So don't think that I'm forgetting this because as I said earlier, we will use tag. So we'll remember this and come back and you know try to visit this. Now, in order to remember, when, when I use the word remember, how do I remember? Because there are some vertices which are yet to be visited. There are some vertices which have already been visited. Now, this is a graph. See, if it's a linked list, you can keep going from one end to the other. Uh, that is starting node, there's no problem. There is no question of that you should remember which one you have visited, which one you have not visited. But here it's not like that. Because, for instance, if you're at two, uh, you know, the three adjacent vertices are one, four, and five. But actually, you have already visited one. So you should not revisit again. So in order to remember whether you have already visited a vertex or not, we maintain an array called visited. Now this is a very simple one dimensional array of size n, n number of vertices. So initially I can say that the vertex number one, two up to eight, all marked with zero. Now zero indicates that it is not yet visited, it means unvisited. The moment you visit any vertex, you just turn this into one. So for instance, one I have already visited, so I mark this as one. And two, I just mark it as one. So before you actually ascertain whether you have uh, to visit this vertex or not, first ascertain from the visited array that whether it has one or zero. If it has zero, it's unvisited. If it is one, you should not revisit again. So now from one, I have two and three, both will have zero, zero in the array and I can select any one. I have selected this and I have marked this as one because it's already visited. So from this again, I have two adjacent vertices four and five and those will have zeros and I can select any one I like. So I'll just show this step by step so that it becomes easy. Yeah, this is the shaded one indicate that it is visited and two and three unvisited. So I can select two. You can see here it's visited. So the white background indicates that it is unvisited. So this information is recorded or remembered in, I mean, by using an array called visited. So I just come to two. Now four and five are the adjacent vertices. I go to four and uh, from four I have now is already visited. Now eight is unvisited, so I can go to eight. It's all depth wise. That's why it's called depth first. So it's not like breadth. Okay, now from eight, I have four which are already visited. Now three unvisited vertices are there. So I can go to five now. You can see here. Now the question is at five, I have two adjacent vertices, two and eight. Now both are visited. That means in the array, I will have one, one. Now what do I do? I simply come back. That means in the, in the stack, I just pop out the most recent return address. What is that? It is eight because you went from eight to five. See, eight to five you went and five you have visited. And now that you don't have any unvisited adjacent vertex, so again, come back to eight and look for any other unvisited. Yes, I have this, six. So I go to six, you can see here. From six, I have one unvisited, so go to three. Three on one visited, seven. Now from seven, I have both visited. So go back to three because that's where you came from. No more unvisited, come back to six and so on and come back to one again, okay? So that's where this uh, blue colored one indicates the path traced by this DFS. So I'll just uh, repeat this again. Started from one, so two, then from two to four, four to eight, eight to five, then eight to six, then six to three, three to seven. So you can see here one, two, four, eight, five, six, three, seven, the corresponding edges. So you get a tree actually. You can see here there are no cycles. This is basically a tree which is called as, you know, DFS tree. So 
starting from the given vertex, you just go depth wise and look for unvisited vertex and keep going until you finish visiting all the vertices. Eventually, my visited array will have all ones if it is a connected graph. So this is the uh, DFS methodology for uh, traversing the graph. So how do we write the algorithm? This is very simple. OK, before we go to the algorithm, we will take some more scenarios where we have uh, the directed graph. See, we have seen the previous example as undirected, but now we will see strongly connected, directed. The same thing happens. So we start from one. Uh, there are two adjacent, so I just go to two. So this is the edge. So one and two. So sorry, this is visited. This is also visited. Now from two, I have three which is unvisited. So I can go to this. This is also visited. From three, I have unvisited four. So that's done. So this is very simple because it's a strongly connected graph. Follow the same method. You'll be able to get the DFS tree. The other scenario is undirected but disconnected graph. So you can see here I have uh, one subgraph here, another one here, but the entire graph has eight vertices. So what we have to do here, we start from one, as you can see here, from one I go to two, the thick edges. Then from two I go to three, you can here, see here, go to three, so one is visited, two is visited, three is visited. Now adjacent to three, I have one and two, both are visited. So I go back to two and then unvisited one is four. So from two, I have again four. So this is one tree, DFS tree I got. Now there is no connectivity between this one, eight, another subgraph. I do. Because DFS normal algorithm will start from one and then try to look for all adjacent vertices. If there is no adjacent vertex, it has to come out. So the thick lines indicates the tree edges and the dotted lines indicate the back edge. That means from three, what is the back edge? It's actually one. Similarly for four, it's a one again. Okay. So what is a tree edge? Whenever a new what unvisited vertex is reached for the first time, it is attached as a child to the vertex from where it is being emerged. So this is the first time, you know, one to two, two to three like that. Whereas back edges is not like that, leading to the previously visited vertex other than its immediate predecessor, because from three to two, maybe it's immediate predecessor, but what we want is in that link, what is the Lead previously visited vertex, but its ancestor. So I get this first, but I have to initiate my DFS again in order to complete this, com you know, uh, visiting of all the vertices. So I can start with any vertex. I'll start with five. Then six is the adjacent one. From six, I have seven, seven to eight. So you can see here five, six, seven, eight. The ancestor for eight is actually five. You can see this is the back edge. Now we have two components which we call it as this is a connected component. This is another connected component. So this let's say A, this is B. So if I have a disconnected graph, I'll get connected components plural because it depends upon how many such subgraphs are there or making it as a full graph. So you will be able to get all this. So disconnected graphs may lead to finding out uh, several connected components and uh, uh, we need to initiate DFS for many times. How do we do it? So we'll come to that later. But this is another possibility. The fourth one is directed but weakly connected. <clears throat> that means you don't have for every pair of vertices that exists a path from I to J and J to I. If it doesn't, then it is called as a weakly connected graph. So, for example, from one, I cannot go to three. In fact, for from two, from four, from five, I cannot go to three. So this, if it is I and this is J, I to J is not possible. Maybe J to I is possible. 
So what do we do? We start from one. So one is visited, two it's okay. From two it's five is okay. You can see here one to two, there's a thick ones are the path traced by the DFS, five. So one to two, two to five. Unfortunately from five, I don't have any other adjacent vertices, I cannot go. So now this becomes one connected component, one to five. Again, I initiate maybe from three, go to three to four. If I initiate from four, again, it's not possible. So four will become one connected component, three will become another connected component. Okay, let's finish this topic by going through the algorithm. So let's assume that we have a connected graph, not a general algorithm, but we assume that it has a connected graph. So what is the input? It's a graph G with some starting vertex. If it's not given, you can start from the first vertex, any vertex. So let us assume that it is visited. That means we are putting one into that starting vertex. I told you already visited is a vector or an array, one dimensional, where each location, the size of course is same as the number of vertices. So each entry in that will indicate, one indicates that it's visited, a zero indicates that it is unvisited. So we assume that visited vector is already initialized to zeros, all locations zeros. So now since the starting vertex, so I can just mark it as one. Now this is a peculiar algorithm here. You can see that I have a for loop. So it's a iterative one. So this is my for loop. Inside this for loop, I have a recursive call, DFS, you can see here. So this is a, a peculiar algorithm where I need to execute this recursion for so many times. That means for loop, it's a definite loop. It's not an indefinite loop, it's a definite loop. Okay, so what do we do for each vertex W adjacent to V? So let's assume that I have one I have some vertices adjacent to this. Okay. So this is my starting vertex. This is already visited. And for each vertex W adjacent to V. So this is V. So which are my adjacent vertices? 3 and 2 or 2 and 3. So this is my W1. This is my W2. So the for loop is required in order to make sure that I pick each and every adjacent vertices. That's possible only through for loop. I don't know how many such adjacent vertices are there. So as long as I have adjacent vertices, I can easily get them. Because we have already seen in ADT, I can actually use the function adjacency function in which I'll get a list of all the adjacent vertices. So that's enough. I just go, go through that. Okay, out of these adjacent vertices, I should check whether it's already visited or not. If it is visited already, I don't really go for recursion. Means I don't explore the adjacent vertices of that. Instead, if it is zero, I need to explore. So I just take first vertex. So I'll just take, let's take uh, two because W1 and W2. So I just take this. So this W becomes W1, which is now two. So now this two will be my V. So from two, because my basic, see what is recursion? You start executing the same function again and again, the next step, next step, next step, and so on. So the first step, I started with vertex number one. Now I'm going to do the same work from two. So come here and mark that as one because visited, right? And all the other adjacent vertices with respect to this W now, which is W1 actually, which are those vertices one and four. Now out of one and four, one is already visited. So W1 is this now, this is gone. So this is my W1, this is my W2. So W1 is already visited, it is not zero, it's actually one. 
So what do I do? Again, go to the for loop and execute the next vertex, which is W2, which is unvisited because it's zero. So now what happens? Again, make this four instead of two. Now this becomes four. So again, go and mark this. So that's what exactly we have done while tracing the execution or the working of this DFS. So start from here, go to the unvisited vertex and then start exploring all the adjacent vertices in case if it is yet to be visited and keep going and remember the entire path of this you will get the tree. So you can, I, I have not put any print statement here. Normally what we do is we can just print which are the vertices which we come across in the process of traversal. So we can just print it. So this is an algorithm which actually gets us the way in which you can traverse the given graph. But assuming that it's a connected one, it's only one. Supposing if you want to get all the connected components, you have to execute this again and again uh, by noting that uh, whether the visited vector has all ones. Supposing if one of the vertices is zero, what does it mean? It is not visited. For example, in this case, my visited vector, I have eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have uh, eight uh, locations or eight is my. So one, two, three, four will all be ones and five, six, seven, eight will be zeros at the end of calling the DFS first. So this is my starting vertex. So I'd have called DFS, it would have marked uh, one, two, three, four as one and all this is zero. So what I can do is I can just check this array, going through this array with a simple for loop, keep going one, 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 one. Well, the moment you get zero, stop. Pick that vertex number, again called DFS. So now this will be marked as one, 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 one. So you get one more connected comb. That's it. So the, the, the algorithm can be modified here in order to make it more general. See, this is the for loop which I was talking about to get all the connected components even works for the disconnected graph. So we can just check whether this array has at least one in the visited sorry, any zeros in the visited vector. If it is zero, that means that it is a disconnected one. You can start initiating DF. So that's exactly what this algorithm does. Thanks for watching. We will meet again. Thank you.